Welcome, everyone, to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast. We are doing a record club episode this week. The long-awaited, long-anticipated coverage of my recommended album this week. We are talking about Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds Ghost Team. And, well, (laughs) Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. There's obviously an awful lot to get into. Yeah. Before this is the 17th uh, studio album of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, the long running um, and genre defying musical project of Nick Cave, Warren Ellis, et al. Um, a, and, and in many ways, this record is a culmination in a lot of different respects. It is the final uh, record in an informal trilogy of albums. Um, that begins with uh, 2013's Push the Sky Away and then 2016's Momentous Skeleton Tree. Uh, it is, but it is a record that kind of is a culmination of that trilogy and also is a culmination of a long kind of arc for the bad seeds. Sees a noticeable kind of drift away from some of the more industrial, heavier and more percussive music that that band kind of cut their teeth making. Um, beauty, like in the conventional musical sense, has always been a big part of, of the Bad Seed sound and the kind of beautiness and beauty and ugly and, and their relationship. Um, but this is a record that very much, I think, sheds a lot of the kind of um, darker sounds and sonic atmospheres for something that is more conventionally pretty than anything else the Bad Seeds have ever made. Um, and also worth noting as well, is alongside a record like Skeleton Tree, uh, these are albums where the collab- the direct collaboration between Nick Cave and Warren Ellis is kind of at the heart of the music on the record, which is not to discount the contributions of the other Bad Seeds, of course, but um, the bedrock of a lot of these songs are kind of electronic loops or synthesizers played by uh, Warren. So in, in many ways, it feels like despite its sprawling size, it's a 68 minute long album. Uh, in many ways, it's one of the most intimate Nick Cave and the Bad Seed records as well. Um, and, and, and okay, so with regard to context, there's an obvious sort of elephant in the room as well. Um, White and, elephant, you might say. Well, hey. We did cover the most recent Nick Cave and Warren Ellis album, by the way, if you want to go check that out to see what we all thought of that, because that's an interesting little follow-up to Ghosting. But as Tyler was saying, there's an interesting, well, not interesting, but there's an important thing to address with Ghosting. Yeah, so so Ghosting is ostensibly a, at its heart, at its core, to kind of uh, break it down to the, the, the heart of what it is about. It is about the processing of grief, um, specifically the processing of the grief of Nick himself and his wife Susie for their son Arthur, who died in um, 2015. Uh, It is a record not just about the processing of grief, but the coexistence alongside it. Um, And a lot of this particular topic, because of the narrative of Nick Cave's career and, and, and because of the narrative that I guess a lot of um, music journalists and people in generally have kind of pushed onto the records above and beyond what Nick himself has said. Um, a re- this particular topic tends to get more frequently associated with the preceding record, Skeleton Tree, which was, um, again, as I say, in the public perception at the very least, informed by the fact that that was the first record that was released after the death of, of Nick's son, um, and which happened a year prior to its release. Um, it is, of course, worth noting, though, that that record was basically 90, 95% finished before this event happened, though Nick did make some lyrical and musical amendments uh, in the interim time. Um, and, and that record was not intended to be a statement on, on Arthur's death specifically, um, despite how neatly that may map onto some of that record's more morose or emotional sentiments, it's still obviously a very dark and very sad and very anguished album in and of itself. Yeah. I just want to say, it's also worth saying, I've been reading uh, one of Nick Cave's novels uh, in the recent times. It was written 
uh, between Dig Last or Stig and Push the Sky Away, which addresses almost all of the same themes in terms of death and grief and ugliness yes. and things like that. They, they were headed really, in this direction yeah. since Push the Sky Away musically, I think fairly obviously. So this was just sort of a, a coalescence that, you know, a tragic coalescence, but one yeah. none the same. And there's definitely a, a preoccupation of, of next, a lot of these kinds of morbid fascinations. But what uh, I suppose in terms of the artistic development of Nick and the band, what I suppose is the most um, fascinating outcome of this tragic, horrible event in that respect is the kind of perspective shift that uh, is reflected in Nick's writing, a kind of attitude shift that is reflected in Nick's writing with relation to um, these particular kinds of morbid topics. He focuses less on kind of the ugliness of humanity and more on a kind of sense of wonder and awe that is imbued in the fragile relationship between life and death, for instance. And that is all over this specific record, which is definitely, it is fair to say, intended to be the record that unpacks the next state of mind, uh, next place, and next um, experience in the wake of this unfathomable tragedy. Uh, and, and of course, there was a period of, of an interim period um, where Nick, of course, was unsure with how he would come to terms with um, whether it would even be appropriate to and how it would be appropriate to address these kinds of specific and personal topics in his art. Uh, and as such, the uh, gestation period for Ghosting was, cons was a considerable amount of time. This record came uh, in October of 2019, and it had been over four years since, um, excuse me, three years since um, Skeleton Tree. Um, but, but Ghosting is, and what well, Ghosting is a record that does tackle grief, um, to put it into one word, head on for sure. Um, there are also a lot of ways that I think this record is distinct from a lot of other records that are of its type, for lack of a better word, or that get lumped in with it. Um, and and one of, I know this is an important point. Uh, in the years prior, um, to the release of Ghosting in the world of alternative music uh, in various kind of genres. Uh, numerous records were released that caused a sensation that had people utterly gripped by their frank, brutal directness, their mundanity, their quote unquote honest expressions of an immediate grief. Uh, the two that come to mind most immediately are Touche Amore's Stage 4, and Mount Airy's A Crow Looked at Me. These are records that captivated the uh, public consciousness in the world of alternative music. And, and people fixated on them because of how raw and intense they were and how uh, those kinds of emotional experiences in art do tend to get, people do tend to gravitate towards them as these kinds of curious artifacts of the state of mind that might be intensely familiar to you and, and is such incredibly cathartic to experience on a record or incredibly foreign to you and is such very artistically interesting. And so that I think explains a lot of the uh, attention that those records have. They're the most, by far the most popular of albums put out by either of those respective artists. Uh, but Ghost Theme is a vastly different album to either of these. Uh, it bears basically no similarities except for the most superficial, shallow ones. Uh, and to see records like those lumped in together with this uh, um, as artifacts to kind of gawk at these transcendental experiences of, uh, these transcendental expressions of the most devastating emotional experiences is so frustratingly reductive and so utterly thoughtless. Um, a lot of people, whether intentionally or not, are content to reduce works like these to a single dimension, to cast them in a particular light as being unambiguously and essentially about grief or about death or whatever. They never really contend with the music on any level beyond that. And they compartmentalize it into neatly into these categories with no real consideration for their many nuances, shades, angles, and sides. Ghosting, I think, is particularly notable in this manner because I think it deviates uh, more strongly from that template of directness, the potent imagery of yesterday you died and I'm standing over your casket and et cetera, et cetera, to explore the experiences and mindset of Nick 
and his wife in a more poetic, abstract, and frequently metaphysical way, um, all in keeping with Nick's heavy literary style and interests. Nick, no doubt, speaks with a directness of his own here, and at points even does seem to be recalling direct experiences and engaging in direct one-to-one -one expressions from himself to his deceased son and vice versa. Um, but even so, things are seldom unambiguous with a record like this. It is so much richer and more broadly concerned with the world, um, with this sort of experience and this thing that Nick has gone through being really just a, a part of it. I, uh, first of all, yes to, to all of that. And that's part of the reason I wanted and was so eager to cover uh, Ghostine on this show in some capacity, not just because like, you know, Nick Cave and the Bad Saints, they're, now, they're a band we talk about a lot. We have covered them, well, quasi covered them on this show, but we talk about them a lot. They're one of my five favorite bands ever. I've been listening to them since I got into music. And this was the first album of theirs that I got to witness the rollout for because I got into them right after Skeleton Tree. So the interesting thing of getting into Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds is that you really just sort of, they have such distinct eras of music. They have their like really, you know, their more gothy post-punky roots and how they sort of explore that sound and grow that sound. And then how they just sort of lean into different uh, places of alternative music. And once we get to push the sky away, you have this insane paradigm shift where you're incorporating all of these electronic elements and synth heavy stuff that really wasn't on previous, like it, it wasn't totally unprecedented, but largely the raw amount of the production and the different stuff they were doing was basically unprecedented. And then you get to Ghostine where it was just sort of announced to happen. And, you know, it's got an album cover that looks like this and it's just it's kind of like and it's called ghost teen and you're just kind of like what the fuck this doesn't feel right this feels very odd and then you you know you're a nick cave and the bad seeds fan even the more electronic direction on something like skeleton tree is still the the roots of it are still very baked into post-punk and that sort of sound it's just sort of filtered through a different layer and then you get ghost teen which you immediately turn on and the first fucking song spinning song comes on and you're just hit with these really bright really really just like almost well, not blaring just because they're not loud but they're so sensuous they're so enveloping synth sounds and to the point where it's like it has tyler kind of alluded to it it's an album that sort of defies genre in many ways is that if i had to say what this really really if i had to say like if i could encapsulate the entirety of it in in one genre descriptor the broadest one i could use would be chamber pop it's there's a lot of this really baroque really really just layered like you know it has that sort of warren ellis uh arrangement to it that makes it feel very ornate very pretty and i feel like that sound even for people who enjoyed albums like skeleton tree or put this uh, push the sky away did kind of uh, hold some people at uh, arm's length with ghost teen at first just because of how different that approach was and i feel like some people kind of uh, wrote it off a little bit morgan on this podcast included he was just like he couldn't really get on board with with it at, at first and now he considers the album to be among Nick Cave's best. Um, I certainly took a bit uh, warming up to it myself just because it was so strange and you know the production on it is a little bit you know it's a bit more compressed it's a bit uh, uh, there's you know they're fitting a lot into these songs they're really 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 dense and that might not like gel with everybody but first of all if you know if that bothers you buy it on vinyl that problem kind of goes away and uh, secondly it's just you really just kind of got to look into what he's doing and, and get into it because I, I promise you, this isn't like when we covered something like ultra pop and the compression or the, um, the, the production as a whole sort of can be a make it or break it situation for you. I really do think that all of this is, should be the way that it is. I wouldn't change a single fucking thing in this entire 68 minute long album. And the fact that Nick is so like, 
the, the fact that Tyler talked about this is, is really, uh, I'm, I'm glad you did that at the beginning because it lets, it just sort of like puts a good avenue to just talk about what the album is, what the music is, because uh, I feel like that's kind of overlooked. It's just sort of like the, the actual musical content of it is kind of ignored because it has this label as being a grief album. And it's like, yeah, yeah, but it's, you know, pay attention to the artistry, pay attention to the composition and I mean, I, the lyricism. I think, true, I think that's true of most albums that are considered grief yeah. records. It, it's, um, it's, like, it's very frustrating good, to be fans of them too, I think. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, if it covers subject matter like that, I know lots of albums and songs that are about really dark subject matter that are dog shit, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> but, like, the thing is, this isn't a dark record, and I don't even really... No, 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 it's not at all. Like, the, so, the like, album cover yeah. is very emblematic of what exactly. this album sounds like and my, is like aesthetically. Well, exactly, but my point is more that um, the reason they're good is not just that they're about these things that they're about, yeah. right? Like, Precisely. That, it, they have to live up to the promise they set by laying down the fact they're going to talk about it. Yeah, no, what they sure. do. It's not the reason that they're good, but it, it, I focus mostly on the subject matter and the topic of this record because that, I think, is at the heart of it. And that's the yeah. reason why it was made. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the thing with labels and stuff, with just trying to describe this record and the way that it sounds, is that it's so manifold like it is it's not a dark record but yet it does have some really dark moments it's not mm -hmm. a record about grief and yet grief is definitely a feather of the bow like grief is definitely a part of the record that flows through a lot of the songs it is yeah. the, the 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 i guess the way i would i would describe it is kind of a, a record about wonder about kind of the relationship between the tangible world and the intangible world and this is you said funny. metaphysical earlier and that's what i actually interpret the album to be about broadly is nick's connection be it positive or negative to the metaphysical that is the yeah. the album that's, is that broadly that's, that's the theme it. on every single one and like when i think about the vibe of the record it's not grief stricken the vibe i get is of like an aching you know um, yeah, longing. These are all things yeah. that Nick has explicitly spoken about in connection to this record. In fact, when you if you do research on this record, you'll find that of all the records Nick has made, this is curiously enough the one, maybe the one he has spoken about and given the most insight into. Which I think is interesting because in many mm -hmm. ways it feels like one of the records that uh, reveals itself to you the most generously when you listen to it. Uh, but one particular quote that I'm drawn to from the very first issue of his Q&A blog, uh, The Red Hand Red Files, Hand Files. There's this specific quote, uh, which he says, I have found a way to write beyond the trauma, authentically, that deals with all manner of issues, but does not turn its back on the issue of the death of my child. I wow. found with some practice, the imagination could propel itself beyond the personal into a state of wonder. And I think this state of wonder is um, suffused across this entire record. And many of these songs do touch on the feelings and experiences of grief, but only insofar as they are a part of this weaving tapestry that deals with our relationship with uh, existence and our relationship with the world. And it is touched on in a lot of the songs on this record. Uh, although before I get into them, Another thing that's also worth mentioning as a piece of context and as a piece of the picture of, of Nick's uh, continuing experience and of grief and a continuing uh, relationship with death is the death of Conway Savage, um, who was the pianist, writer, vocalist, performer, and key member of the Bad Seeds band who performed on every record from Henry's Dream through to Push the Sky Away. He passed away in September of 2018 over a year before the release of Ghosting. And while of course, we do not know the extent to which his death informed the writing or recording of this record, we would be equally wrong to either dismiss it outright or to project it fully. Um, it's a curious piece of this kind of picture if you're gonna involve um, Nick's own personal experiences in life into discussing this record, which I think you should. It's also a, uh, perhaps gives a little bit of an insight into what was um, driving Nick's state of mind on this record. There are moments here where he speaks directly to 
presumably and, and based on what he has said explicitly, his son on the metaphysical plane. And those are his words as well. He mm -hmm. sings of experiences he has had engaging in conversations and interactions with his son after his death. His process of coming to not just accept the new state of things, and this is another point I want to make. A lot of discussions of, about art, a lot of discussions of art about grief focus on the path to acceptance, as though grieving people are these naive fools who persistently reject reality. What yeah. Nick allows us passage to here is not solely a journey to acceptance. Uh, as much as a journey to understanding. Uh, the line with which Nick ends the record, it's a long way to find a peace of mind. I'm still waiting for peace to come. I think touches on this. Uh, peace of mind goes beyond simply an awareness and a confrontation with the inevitability of death, but a relationship with it, whereby you, this living and, and sentient being, come to a, a mutual understanding with this inevitable state of ending regardless of whether you're religious or spiritual and you believe it to be a mere transition or whether you're a hardcore extinctivist and you believe that death is the ultimate nothingness. Ghostine, I think, is a record that tracks Nick's passage to understanding the state of being, of understanding the relationship between all things, the relationship between life and death and, and the beauty in the world. Like the great thing about that final line is it can't be understated how much of like a journey you have been on by the time you get to that point in the record. Cause it's it's a long one and it's very um it's it's frank whilst being cryptic, but it's never didactic, but it's very open. Yeah. Um it's and, it's great that you you point that out because I think that's an essentially Nick Cave way to approach this kind of, like all of these like approaches that Tyler's talking about and like that final line being sort of a synecdoche for the whole thing is that yeah, I think yeah. that like for all the things that are different about this like I was talking about what it was like the first hear this album when it came out mm -hmm. is that the album does have lots of things that are different about it and lots of things that are um, very qu quintessentially of this particular record of it part of its own identity mm -hmm. but like the way that Nick sort of like leads into it and uses these songs structurally and like just you can tell by what Tyler read off of the red hand files that he's a very naturally prose heavy very um and just very poetic beautifully put way to phrase what he's sort of doing um, yeah and it yeah. starts out beautifully on the first song where he just sort of tells this very Nick Cavey story. He just sort of goes into it. You have those like really bright synthesizers and immediately you have the first fucking lines on the album are once there was a song, the song yearned to be sung. It was a spinning song about the king of rock and roll. The king was, a f was first a young prince. The prince was the best. With his black jelly hair, he crashed onto a stage in Vegas. And it's like, this is this is just like reminding you it's like putting you back in your comfort seat of just like this is all the stuff that we're doing but also yeah it is me nick cave telling you all of these stories and stuff this is just like yeah. when he talks about on uh fucking like henry's dream has lyrics that are just like that what, what's yeah. great about spinning song uh and, and what you exactly what you're saying is is that integration of the myth of, of elvis and that kind of storytelling mm -hmm. tradition that we're expecting from nick cave of these kinds of like historical figures but also the way that he then weaves that into what this album is going to be about. Yeah. Because um, yeah. this song is a song about legacy, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, it zeroes in on the legend of Elvis, and then it zooms out to the ultimate peace beyond death, when a story is settled and it continues to touch lives and influence those left behind and those who come after. It's like a defiant statement that death is not the ultimate end, and which is a hell of a way to begin this album, and, and that the immediacy of the grief that follows it is really just a transitory state as legacy and impact and the wider reach of a life settle into being. Uh, the last part of the song, which is Nick's repetition of I love you and peace will come, are these oh. two repetitions yeah. that most assuage the grief, uh, that the love continues between you and the deceased person and between you and others who are also affected by the loss of that person. 
and that you're all bound together through a turbulent journey towards a new world, one that will make itself whole and right again, and that will be stronger for the bonds of the legacy of the person who is now gone. It's just yeah, an incredible beginning to the record. And this leads really well into something uh, uh, sort of trying to lead into, I guess, which is that it's bookended by two very sparse moments of instrumentation with when he talks about the spinning song at the beginning and then uh, what he says at the end. Um, and what I think is really interesting is about the way with these two very sparse pieces of instrumentation across a very lush record, like the tone of um, the melodies change and shift. Like at the beginning, he talks about the story of Elvis, right? But it's with a very dark and brooding instrumental and it frames Elvis as this uh, mythological figure in a way he talks about it in terms of kings and great falls and then we bring it in with sort of the crassness of falling on the stage in vegas of course which is a nick cave trademark technique um but and across the record you get broadly extraordinary extraordinarily sort of warm and luscious instrumentations when he is attempting to invite you into something very personal and then by the end what you get it's an equally sparse instrumentation to lead you out after a pretty epic journey and across which he brings in many sort of mythological comparisons towards sort of medieval ideas mm. um like a bell then, curve in that respect of like how yeah. the instrumentation works mm -hmm. it's sort of like a whoosh. yeah and it ties in really well to the idea that this record is not just about reaching a level of closure and acceptance right because what you get by the end isn't bright shiny happy what you get by the end is complicated you know mm -hmm. um it feels like it's still reaching for something and the acceptance isn't of the death but it is of that never-ending search and reaching of something yeah. that's sort of unresolved uh, it's uh, like the melody builds and then you get a repeating melodic line and it constantly hooks you into this idea of searching and yearning for something you're not finding yeah. you know i i think another aspect of the record structure that i think helps to kind of explain this and the way that with the exception of, of Spinning Song, I suppose, which is kind of like a tone setting track. The record for the most part has those kind of more luscious and huge sounding orchestrations in the first um, half and then more minimal and pared back towards the end. It's actually the way that this record is cleaved into two distinct halves by yep. Nick himself. Uh, and they're subtitled as well. The first, um, and I say half, but it's like, most of the tracks of the record in the last two major tracks are quite long. It's, it's like tracks one through seven, to half the runtime. Yeah. Yeah. Like tracks uh, from Spinning Song through Leviathan is, is sort of side one of the album, which is subtitled um, The Children. And then yeah. side two of the album, the final three tracks, is subtitled The Parents. And I think you could equally um, replace those subtitles with um, Those Who Lead for the first side of the record and those who are left behind for the second half of the record. Uh, it is, uh, they, both of these distinct halves of the record both uh, capture various perspectives on either side of this d divide between parents, those who are left behind and children, those who leave, not just in the sense of, of leaving as, a, as an, in terms of death, but just generally as a departure, you raise and then you say goodbye and, and they become the parents and the cycle perpetuates itself. Um, but there is a distinction between these two halves of the record uh, in, in terms of the tonality and the feel and, and the one, that sense of wonder that is so rich and, and, and gorgeous and beautiful in the first half of the record and then kind of uh, becomes more, I guess, bittersweet um, towards the end of the record. I think it's, it's all encapsulated beautifully, I think, in the title track, which is kind of like the best of both worlds. It's my favorite yeah. song on this record. It has this incredibly lush first half and then this very, very minimal back half that is much, much more pared back. And, and once again, with this specific song, which I'm going to zero in on, uh, I go back to Nick and the Red Hand Files. He's spoken about this song specifically. He says, in the song Ghosting, the baby bear goes to the moon in a boat and, and Ghosting is the boat. It, it sails through the dark to the stars. It is a galleon ship collecting fireflies and spirit children as it goes. At times, uh, ghosting may feel unmoored and homeless, but it is pointed firmly toward paradise. The crew is joyous, 
the world smiles and the sun bursts over the edge of the earth. Uh, okay. And I, I'm, I'm particularly enamored with that imagery that I think carries and is suffused across this entire record. Um, there are recurring references to specific um, uh, figures as well that I'll get into a bit later on too. But I think this meeting point at the center of the record in this title track is, is kind of like the passage from one side to the next. Yeah, and that ties into two very interesting things about the record that I have been sort of captured by. One, the first one is the track Ghosting Speaks, which I think is incredible. You know, if you're talking about this concept, it's quite hard to ignore. But I, I think that people who are more familiar with this record could speak on that better. So I'll move on to something I could probably be more eloquent on, which is the cover art, right? Mm. Um, like when I look at the cover art, thank you, Jake. What I think is what I think is the Garden of Eden, frankly. Um, and that's, that just completely ties in with the very, um, with the sense of unknown on this record for a start, with the sense of yearning for something in a metaphysical way that there you have no ability to relate to, I guess. And secondly, that sense that the people that, um, not only in death is there the potential to move on to something better in the aftermath, but also the idea that it's a long way to find peace of mind. There is a sense of peace in the future that, that is yet unattainable, but one day maybe you can reach that if you keep pushing for the whole of your life in the same way. Like that's what heaven is, what the Garden of Eden is. It's this promise that sometime in the future, this hard work will mean something, I guess. This emotional work will mean something. Yeah, absolutely. And I will add to what you're saying as well. The cover art is actually a, a painting called The Breath of Life uh, by the artist Tom Boy, And it is actually depicting the Garden of Eden. Um, specifically. Oh, great. And it was chosen. There we go. It was chosen by uh, Nick for, for that reason. And I think uh, what you're touching on about like, you know, the struggle and the, the processing and all that sort of thing. What I think Nick tries to do with this record and, and with a lot of those metaphysical elements and a lot of those fantastical elements, again, the imagery of horses and the sun uh, and the forest, those three specific things, which are stand-ins for three specific things that I'll get to in a second, are all purposefully deployed to um, create this kind of fantastical realm that uh, links and passages between life and death and allows those two, these two kind of realms of existence or a realm of existence and a realm of non-existence to kind of be tied together as a part of the grieving process, as a part of the process of understanding um, the relationship between the two of them and um, the fact that they, that one, that they are just both must be experienced um, and, and one having to losing a person to the other side um, is obviously a thing that is inevitable and will always happen but this record kind of draws those two things together as an, to, and reflects I think Nick's experience and Susie's experience as well um, coming to terms with that and coming to terms with saying goodbye and yeah basically um, Bright Horses, I think, when I think of this album and I think, look at the cover art, immediately the song Bright Horses comes to mind. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it is like the imagery of the record's cover, evoked as a fantasy to sustain its author's state of wonder and connection to his lost loved one. But, the, but what's interesting about this song is that uh, in the second verse of the track, the fantasy fades and he comes to terms with a bitter alternative that the little white shape dancing at the end of the hall is just a wish that time can't dissolve all, which is maybe my favorite line on the album. Um, you have these two opposing states in the first two verses that are then married in the final verse, which is played as a mixture between a uh, difficult reality and a continuation of the fantasy, the choosing to believe that the end is not the end, that one form of physical, tangible connection being cut off by this event does not erase the underlying spiritual harmony between the two forces of Nick and Arthur Kay. Uh, Nick evokes blues and jazz singers and a tradition of spiritualized sadness with lines like, 
there are some things that are hard to explain, but my baby's coming home now on the 5.30 train. Um, and he elaborates th on that further in waiting for you as well when he states explicitly that sometimes a little bit of faith can go a long way. You do get that evocation of a lot of religious iconography and specifically the image of, of a dying Jesus is brought up at multiple points. Yeah, the uh, well. statue is what's specifically being referred to for the most part. But what I find interesting lyrically is that while it is referencing the obviously the Pieta statue, I liken the lyrics how it only refers to this statue as uh, basically Jesus being held by his mother in a way that doesn't really specify his age. So one can take that as either at the end or the beginning of his life. Oh, that's yeah. perfect. That's Once incredible. again, tying into this cyclical nature of everything and what i love about that illusion that he makes is like i pretty immediately understood the statue he was referring to but you never feel like he's layering on sort of artistic pretense it's always just um it's done in this very um matter of fact way mm -hmm. that it doesn't feel like you know i've seen so many filmmakers recreate that statue in terms of their blocking yeah and it's so heavy-handed and awful but when he just alludes to it in that way as just jesus being held by his mother i'm like that is tasteful and i appreciate it it, it comes to the fore specifically in the track fireflies it's alluded to in the opening track of this piece um, the line specifically is Jesus lying in his mother's arms is a photon released from a dying star, which is another one of my favorite lines on this whole album. And I, I, I like this line, particularly I looked at the statue and obviously the statue is meant to evoke death and sorrow. But I, as you've already said, the, at August and Sarah, both of you, as you've already said, the state in which Nick evokes it is less specific to that. Um, but I do like the comparison or the, not even comparison, but the description of, of this uh, tableau as like, um, and of Jesus in the state as a photon released from a dying star. And what I like about that is um, that the photon, like life is transitory, but the photon that is represented by life, the star that, um, the star dust or whatever that we're all formed from is this eternal um, continual thing and that the period of the short period of time at which it takes the form of Jesus or of Arthur Cave or of whoever is just a small percentage of this in, uh, intangible eternal lifespan of this photon that will continue moving through space that will continue barreling onwards to become the next thing and I think that next uh, evocation of this next exploration of this idea is one uh, quite effective and powerful way I think of coming to terms with understanding and accepting death and grief understanding that though the life we experience may be the entirety of our conscious perception it is not the entirety of all that we are you know, if you know what I mean, like, and that ties back again to the sort of ideas of legacy that were touched on earlier in the record as well. It's just such a brilliant line um, that is one of one of the most important on the whole record, I think, uh, and, and encapsulating what Nick is talking about. Yeah, basically. I, I that's it leads perfectly into something that I definitely wanted to mention, which is. I, I came down to the definitive conclusion that Ghostine does in fact contain my favorite Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds song. I've ranted and raved about it to you all, but I just, I'm so fucking enamored with it that I can't help but bring it up because it has like very strong thematic connection to what we're talking about right now. And that's Sun Forest. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, like hands down, I think this is just one of the most beautiful songs ever, ever, ever point blank period. The, the way it sort of gestates at the very beginning with those two minutes of that really soft synthesizer progression, where it's just kind of like ebbing and flowing and just sort of leading you into it. And then eventually it just sort of blossoms at the midway point. And then lyrics come in and he's talking about, um, uh, I'm watching the past behind me and waiting for the future to roll in and how he's like stuck. Uh, and like that's sort of like th this song is just sort of about that sort of ephemera of existing in that particular moment and I think it ties into what August sort of mentioned about the whole like um, not being specific as to the time whether it could be like birth or death or whatever or not like this is about existing in between mm -hmm. two specific states and later he like after there's some more like like so much 
amazing imagery is laid out throughout the cross of uh, the album like on the first song a line that always stuck out to me was uh like uh the king had a queen and the queen's hair was a staircase and i just something about that image is just so evocative to me but that sort of happens here is he's talking about a spiral of children uh climbs up to the sun and sort of like reaching for that, that longing, that sort of ephemeral moment. And then he mentions Jesus being, a man called Jesus uh, specifically he mentions is there. And he's, uh, the, the think the, the image that I think captures the mood of this album the most is the lyric where he says, um, uh, alone, uh, like with a grieving man, with two thieves on either side of him. And I think you can interpret the grieving man as him, the grieving man is as anyone who's just sort of like subjecting like, like lying amidst this sun forest that's sort of described amidst, you know, the fireflies and the butterflies that he's talking about. But the thieves on either side, I think, are in fact the past and the future that he alludes to before as something that time will steal from you and that time has stolen from you. And you have them on opposite sides of the grieving man who's this sort of picturesque uh, like embodiment of that sort of state of being and being stuck in that. And then the way that it just, you know, he sort of says that, you know, that lyric of like, come on everyone. And then the fucking vocal harmonies just kick in and they sort of swirl together. And it's just, it's, it's six minutes of absolute fucking bliss. It's like a micro, like it's sort of the, the centerpiece of the album for me. It's just sort of like, putting you right in the middle of, of all of this and building all of this imagery and then like segueing into into galleon ship the way it does like oh god it's fucking so good yeah. oh my god i love it I, jesus I, christ you brought it up jake because i have a few things to say about some of the imagery in that track as well mm. um I, I, it's, it's evidently one of the most beautiful tracks in the record i'm actually going to tie it um very quickly to the track that precedes it as well that i want to touch on to night ray um, so we have underrated lot, song, terrific yeah. track. So we have a lot of we've talked a lot about how um, death and the transitory uh, nature of existence um, manifests across this record, and we've alluded as well to the um, dichotomy of the Jesus and his mother image. That it could equally be Jesus being cradled as a child, as it could be Jesus being, um, you know, lamented in his death, um, and so this relationship between life and death and this relation is also touched on in terms of the other dichotomy of death which is death and birth as well and the birth aspect is touched on in night raid um it's a song that poetically uh, envisages specifically the birth of next children i'm not sure if, if this is known but arthur was one of two twins that were born yeah. together in a hotel room in the grand brighton hotel uh, and he paints a picture of this moment this calamitous intense beautiful moment that would shape the nick and susie's lives forever in the song night raid he he is this is an incredibly poetic song in terms of the writing he he lines like uh he refers to his children as runaway flakes of snow and sighs released from a dying star again that's letter ref, let, let, letter lyric obviously echoing the lyric about um uh, Jesus and his mother arms as photons emitted from a dying star. So that dying star, that star dust imagery evoked here as well in the context of death equally, in the context of birth equally as in death. Um, and this hotel setting as well, uh, the hotel itself in this song feels more like a vessel through worlds that Nick, his wife Susie and their children are traveling on. And I like in the chorus of the song, they um, next things of leaning out the windows and watching horses in the street, which mm -hmm. carries over into Sun Forest, which has more allusions to horses. And I want to specifically unpack some of the allusions in this track. Uh, I don't think of, uh, when I think of this track, I don't think of the track as being about a, a, a Sun Forest. I think Sun Forest, the title, is uh, meant to be a dichotomy of heaven and earth. And uh, the sun is heaven and the forest is earth. Um, and the children are climbing up into the sun and the parents are left behind within the forest there and it's again like i said earlier it's not just about the passage from life to death as well it is the passage of being a parent and having to bring some kind of creation into the world and then setting that creation free and that allegory also carries over to art as well nick as an artist is creating this piece for us and then he is setting it free he is unleashing it 
into the world for people like you and me to talk about for it to no longer be within his control there's this three-tiered metaphor with the forest and the sun that comes to the fore here on this track and then the horses i think are the vessels um, between worlds that come to carry away the dead and indeed to allow the living to connect with the dead and that connection between nick and his son that remains uh, to this day becomes clearer and stronger as the record goes on. But I think as stated with a beautiful clarity uh, at the end of this song in the lines, I am here beside you, uh, look for me in the sun. I am beside you, I am within the sunshine, in the sun. So if we're to follow this metaphor, we would, this would therefore be uh, Arthur himself speaking to his parents. And that tracks as well with the deliberate callback to these lines in Ghost Dean Speaks, in which um, quite movingly you hear Nick uh, singing from the perspective of his own child, reaching out to be seen. Um, the love between the two as this interworld connection is forged then gets solidified in Leviathan, which is almost like a solemn moment of movement between worlds. Um, and also I wanted, this is a good excuse, I think, to touch very briefly on the title of the album as well, which is um, frequently, I think, slightly misunderstood. So um, the title Ghostin um, is a combination of the word ghost and the Irish language suffix in, which um, in English translates to little, small or benevolent. Um, so Cave took this title from a book about Irish tinkers. Uh, in which the author believes his crying child has been possessed by a ghost. Um, oh, and I bring this up because it's a, a nice uh, elaboration on the core of the record um, and, and this image of a little ghost and, and in any way in which you want to interpret that, but also bring it up because, it, uh, including by me before I learned this, it, the title itself has been uh, misunderstood as just a mere portmanteau of ghost and teen which I think obviously applies as well. But I think I like the actual um, etymological origin of the title. I think it's much no, more. Yeah. Instead, I think the etymological origin of the title of Little Ghost, as opposed to just Ghost Team, is much more in keeping with the sense of fantastical uh, imagery and wonder across the album. Yeah. And uh, if I may briefly touch on it, uh, an interesting Thing I've thought about what during this discussion, the the purpose of describing in spinning song the purpose of describing the uh, king's wife's hair as being like a staircase, when the allusion to going to heaven is frequently described as climbing, a staircase being the descent from a mother, and that being the way one enters the world. So I think that's an interesting little. Yeah, right, that's, that's tied yeah, together. That's fantastic. Yeah, and Nick, Nick does this a lot on the record as well as he alludes to the maternal and um, and obviously makes the re references to his wife, Susie, who, as I've kind of tried to communicate through what I've said, is, uh, and Nick allows to be an equal part of the process of, of grief or the process of, um, of understanding that occurs in this record. And... Um, <laughs> I have no idea how, how she feels about it. I can only assume that she feels positively considering they have such a close relationship. But um, she's alluded to at various points on this record. Obviously, Night Raid, as I said, paints a very intimate moment of, of seeming, seemingly both the conception of the children and their birth within that track, depending on how you read the lyrics. There's a lot of kind of vaguely uh, erotic or, or orgiastic sentiment in that song. But then you have uh, the final track, Hollywood, which I think is, is one of the best songs that Nick has ever written and released. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some really fascinating imagery in this song that I'm trying to get to the bottom of as well. It's like this post-apocalyptic song where Nick and his wife are in a car on the west coast of California, uh, which incidentally was where this record was written and recorded in California. Um, and there is, there are fleeing fires. It's like this apocalyptic scene. And there's this imagery of like one, like a kid with a bat face. Um, and there's, um, he, he evokes wanting to buy a house in the hills with a tear shaped pool and a gun that kills. And then there's a reference to a cougar that roams these parts with a terrible engine of wrath for a heart 
that she is white and rare and full of all kinds of harm and stalks the perimeter all day long, but at night lays trembling in my arms. He, he paints this image of this um, vicious, monstrous creature. And then with that final line, you come to understand that this is a representation of, of Susie, his wife. And he's outright confirmed this as well. Oh, and, and it touches on the ways in which grief can manifest, not just as this kind of longing, uh, desperate sadness, but as this kind of like uh, emotional hurricane that can manifest in, in the form of this beast that will lash out and try to consume anything within its path. And that's such a potent and um, ugly image. And you don't necessarily get that kind of real brutality in, in music or writing that tries to communicate this kind of experience. And that's, we, that's pure Nick Cave, isn't it? That kind of the integration of the brutal, of the primal, of the of the animalistic into the human experience. Um, but I, when I, he sings those lines and he gets that line about this monster laying trembling in his arms, it's genuinely tear jerking. Like I just, oh, yeah. I, I I get so overwhelmed uh, in that moment. And so that's another aspect of the record that is so beautifully layered. Is is that. Um, it's never um, outright stated that the, the feeling Nick is describing is, is as simple as a word like grief, but um, you get the sense of that from this and you get a sense of, of how it is both that and, and so much more than that as well. There's another interesting thing. I, I would not bring this up if it was anyone other than Nick Cave, because I would think that they were probably reading too much into it. But I read on Genius the at the very beginning of uh, Hollywood, where he references the boy with a bat face, is that there's a part in The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot uh, that's uh, a woman drew her long black hair out tight and fiddled whisper music on those strings and bats with baby faces in the violet light swarm. And uh, the part of the book that this is in uh, is specifically uh, a series of visions that are being described as an intertextual relationship with the Hindu holy book. And I think that that's that sort of just gesturing at that sort of relation between the divine and that, that, that connection really, or the, the, the path, I guess, is sort of evoked there. It's like really, really strongly on, on Hollywood in general, just sort of that, you get that almost apocryphal imagery that sort of builds that song that's sort of just kind of like, it's it, it, this whole album is like, when I imagine the, the scenery that Nick builds, it's like all of these common places that are just in these, this like cosmic world that's like of otherworldly beauty, but there's like also just like, a motel there that he's like looking outside and there's like an infinite vast plane in front of him and it's just so it, it, the mm. the the emotion is just so fucking raw that's in that those uh, scenes that he conjures up and i just love it yeah i, love, I, I, love I, I haven't fully came. passed this either but like that image of the motel as well and also the references to california and hollywood there's like a very uh, there's a sense of like an american iconography um, yep transposed across this record too and I that's just a, a, a loose thought I haven't really passed it yet but I find it interesting yeah and that kind of like magical realist cross with like abstract imagery thing is something Nick Cave is that I love about Nick Cave's writing when he does it and does it really well um and this I'm, I'm gonna be honest this is my favorite iteration of that technique of his mm -hmm. um i mean I'll, I'll say this now because i can't see a better opportunity up until about two weeks ago henry's dream was my favorite nick cave and the bad seats record and, and then i listened to ghostine and it, and it wasn't anymore um and in a way that's because if this album feels like it has so many of the ideas techniques trajectories that I love in what Nick Cave does coming to such a clear fruition, you know? And of course the record's great, but it's so satisfying. It's like something that feels like a real uh, arrival of building ideas in an artist's work. 
uh, like in the past week, I listened to From Her to Eternity for the first time. Um, wow. Like the difference is so stark. And I think it's actually really interesting that not long after that record was released, they appeared in the Vim Fenders movie, Wings of Desire, the band, um, which is a movie that is so focused on deep spiritual insight and aesthetic beauty and tonal, uh, like, like the, inv- the evangelicism of the beautiful is like what I think of when I think of Wings of Desire, right? Um, and ever since then, that has felt like something they're getting closer and closer and closer to perfecting. And, and then I listened to Ghostine and, and it's like, wow, you did it. Well done. Yeah, you mentioning um, From Her to Eternity also just reminded me that very recently, um, one of Nick Cave's earliest collaborators and a partner for a short time, uh, Anita Lane, uh, passed away. Uh, that, that was why I listened to it, actually. Yeah, I think about a couple of weeks ago. And she, so she was a big part of the birthday party, Nick's earlier band, and some of the early Bad Seeds records as well. Um, and it, this is that's more of an aside than anything, but um you I, I think when you think about these deaths that are happening like um uh, the deaths i've already alluded to and the relationship with nick uh it, it only i think becomes clearer why uh this has become such a preoccupation of his within his art not just as a in a simple reductive way of like this is how i process the death of my son but in the sense that many kind of great artists who are concerned with massive um, topics related to the nature of humanity as Nick has always been uh, and the darker side of humanity as well eventually as they get older as they age come to contend with their own relationship with mortality in a way that's not just kind of like fictionally um, like like for instance in the early days of the bad seed when you had songs about death like the mercy seat for instance where it's very kind of like the energy is just very uh, theatrical for lack of a better word. And it's this very, very much like ramshackle and funky and fun and, and dark and wacky and wild. And as Nick has aged, his relationship with mortality and death has, has shifted. And you have interesting, different artistic encapsulations of the way in which death and dying is perceived in art and culture just by analyzing the um, body of work of Nick Cave and the Bad Seed over time uh, and the way that particular interest has a shifted in the mode of expression, shifted in the kind of metaphors and literary allusions and first person evocations that Nick chooses to express and explore it. Uh, and then of course the tragic coincidental um, real life underpinnings or real life relationships that also feed into this from when people close to you die as an artist as a human being uh, aging Um, all of these different factors are part of what kind of comes together to make ghostine specifically such a powerful and layered and interesting statement about the relate the how we come to accept and understand and conceptualize our own existence and the existence of other people around us. It's in many ways, though it gets reductively marked down alongside Skeleton Tree as these short-term explorations of grief, uh, in many ways, these records are like culminations of a career-long arc, of a career-long series of interests that have reached this kind of like beautiful, outward-reaching and incredibly wondrous destination. Absolutely. I have nothing to add to that. That's just a wonderful s- statement, you know, you know. I I think the only thing that I want to comment on really is that, like, you know, this is the the final and the sort of unofficial trilogy of records of the the 2010s chapter of this band, and I think that the aesthetic similarities to um, Skeleton Tree are notable. But I definitely think, as we've alluded to, there's a difference in timbre between these and that when I listen to Skeleton Tree that is a very cold desolate album whereas this is an incredibly bright warm album that I just listen to and it's 
insanely comforting. I it's it's grown in a way that's just like digging into all of the lyrics and all of the mythology and all of the dense poetry that Nick has. Like all of that feels like it came from or could only come from a guy who's literally made like 16 other records and has made sort of his name on being someone who likes to tell these stories in these poetic ways. And this sort of feels like a, a real moment, a real culmination in many respects is that, yeah, there's a lot of things that happened uh, that are sort of of the moment uh, that sort of bred this, but it's also just such a blatantly skilled and very obviously impressive showcase of artistic mastery when it comes to both writing and producing that that's sort of where my love and appreciation for it truly lies on just a on a huge holistic level it's such a comforting album and it's also sort of a it's in, when you want to intellectualize a lot of the stuff on it but it's also just it's so very raw and easy to to feel all of the, the the emotional tangibility of it, and it's that's where I think its its strongest uh, aspects lie, and how very tempered it is to connect with you on an emotional wavelength. And I, I just find it a, a monolithically impressive achievement that, like, with any lesser band, this would be head and shoulders their best album. And this is maybe only my third favorite Nick Cave album, which fucking, Jesus Christ. Wait, wait, what are the two? What are, what are, what are, uh, my, my favorite's Henry's Dream, and my second favorite is um, Skeleton Tree. And then wow, good I think, choices. yeah, and then I think, like, right after that is. Uh, let love in and boatman's call so it's just like there's an embarrassment of riches with this yeah. fucking discography i mean man. i think personally it's really worth saying that um the fact that ghost team is so like at least to me i don't know about other people like to me the perfect culmination of so many ideas i've been playing with that could be a really scary thing because it's like like where do, where do you kind of like go from here especially with such a big ambitious record but then i think about the record we reviewed carnage Nick Cave mm-hmm. and Ellis. They're so clearly like of a piece with this trilogy, but a step, not necessarily like a big step forward, but in another direction they could explore. And it's just like, wow, you will just never stop pushing yourself to do new things. And that's yeah, great. yeah. I never thought about it like that. To to draw back briefly to, to, to Skeleton Tree and the moroseness of that record, I almost feel like this record is kind of like if you had an album of distance guides, for instance. Because I think, I often forget how that record for as dark and, and, and genuinely difficult it can be, uh, actually does end in somewhat of an upbeat or at least a po- more positive place with the final two tracks on that record. Um, but it's almost like a naive positivity in those songs. Like you have lines in those last couple of songs of, of Skeleton Tree, like they told us our gods would outlive us, but they lied. And these kind of like quite spiteful, but still kind of like moving out of the nihilism of the earlier parts of that record. And then Ghosting is kind of like some years have passed and Nick has had some time to process that the immediate kind of bluntness of a lot of the emotions that were kind of circling around him at that time. And as a result, I think you get a record that um, relative to a lot of the other albums he's made is so much more uh, richly diverse in such wonderful ways. Um, And really does, again, to use that word for the umpteenth time, feel like a culmination. Um, August, I know you came in late. Um, do you have anything else you want to kind of add about this record or that hasn't kind of been uh, Yeah, a bit, actually, in that uh, listening to this after Carnage was an interesting experience because I assume most of you had heard this first. Uh, I had not. Actually. Okay, so you had not, but Jake and Tyler, and I would presume Morgan had. Yeah. yeah. And what what I found curious about this is I almost feel like some of the instrumental ideas on here, uh, particularly the synthesizer stuff, I feel was really kind of driven forward and perfected on Carnage or may, perfected used in loose terms. But uh, 
It, I feel Carnage did a bit of the synthesizer stuff better. I think the string arrangements here are pretty consistently strong, but the synthesizer stuff did, for me at least, leave a little to be desired, particularly on moments like uh, Leviathan or Ghostine Speaks. I thought those were not quite up to par. The synthesizers didn't quite sound like he was pushing them far enough. And, and this kind of ties into what Sersha was saying about always evolving in that just two years later with Carnage, I'm pretty happy with these same elements. So I think it, for me, was an interesting look back into the evolution of Cave's soundscapes. All I would say with, with regard to the sound of the synthesizers on those tracks in specific is, I mean, my there's definitely a tonality to them that is kind of fuzzy and almost a little bit um, of an earlier time, like weirdly sort of like, as I, I'm not quite sure how to describe them, but in many ways, there's a kind of feeling of um, childlike innocence to them or like childlike um, naivety. I don't really know what the right word to describe it is, but to me, it's kind of like in keeping with the space and the state of the sounds of that part of the record, like the children in the first half of the record. And then the synthesizers get much warmer. And I think of the synthesizers at the in the final part of the title track, for instance, or the gently um, dancing synthesizer melodies all over Hollywood at the very end, being much kind of uh, heavier, darker sounding, um, especially well, the darker sounding thing, I think, especially comes through on the second half of the Ghosting title track. And so I think there's, I mean, in my mind, anyway, there's a difference in some of the aesthetic choices um, between certain parts of the record that I think works for me because it reflects some of those thematic aspects. And I guess for me, in in, op in contrast to that, I just really didn't get that from that. It just sounded a little cheaper, older, perhaps. Fair enough. Yeah. But yeah, no, most of it's still quite good, quite a good album. <laughs> I, I like it agree. because the sounds are uh, pretty. Uh, they sound real nice in my ear holes. Like, that's the thing about like, we touched on this already, but like with the skeleton tree, that is uh, an alienating record, as it should be in many ways. Um, and they do, in I feel like kind of like the reflections of each other in a way. Like the skeleton tree is a is like the real, <laughs> to quote Douglas Adams, a long tea time of the soul. Um, and this is um, something that comes afterwards that's maybe more cathartic in a way. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, I think we've done a pretty good job with uh, Ghostine. Let me see if anyone wants to chime in to say anything else. Okay, so uh, in that case, then we shall do our traditional and move on to our favorite tracks and ratings. Uh, Jake, why don't you lead us off? All right, well, obviously, first favorite, we're going to go with Sun Forest. And oh, fuck me. I mean, there's, there's a decent amount of songs on this record, but like, Oh man, this is one of those albums where I wouldn't rate a single song below like an eight. So like, ah, fuck. Um, but I'm going to say <laughs> uh, Sun Forest, Hollywood, and Spinning Song. And I do want to shout out and say, uh, if you have not heard the live album slash um, like piano instrumental only album, uh, Idiot Prayer, that was released last year by Nick, He's got a lot of the songs that are on Ghostine. His cover of Spinning Song is is, is is real is real good. It makes me cry. It's fine. It's good. It's great. I love it. But if you want to sort of hear a more organic version of some of these songs or some of the songs that are on those 2010s albums, go check that out because you're in for some good shit. And I give the record a 10 out of 10. All right. Uh, my favorites would be Spinning Song. Uh, the title track Ghostine and um, what else and I'd say Bright Horses least favorite would be um, hmm, what, what is it Leviathan probably 
and I'd give it a 7.5 out of 10. Wow, that's pretty that's good. Um, it's worth saying Morgan has given it a 10 but can't be here. Um, and I'm going to say my favourite tracks are probably Hollywood, Ghosting, that, that second the half of the record is real slapping for me. Um, let's say Waiting for You and my least favourite track is Chinese Satellite. I'm giving the record a 10 out of 10. All there. Um, whereas Mer Morgan would say where? <laughs> <laughs> it's like he was almost here. <laughs> um, Holy sh... Uh, that was like right next to understandable. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's like when I'm not hearing you guys do an impression of me. It's like, That's fair. fair. <laughs> fair. Um, so my three favorite tricks are Ghostine, Hollywood, and um, yeah, I'm going to say Song Forest. Uh, least favorite track as probably uh, I guess Leviathan if I had to pick one. Um, and I am going to give the record a 10 out of 10 also. Oh, fuck yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, so what you like to yeah. hear. That's an average of 9.5, bitches. Um, which is, there are five. So I'm all going to read out all of them because I don't, I want to. Um, and that's Metallica, Master of Puppets, Slint, Spyland, Deftones, Diamond Eyes, and Ohms, and Death, Leprosy. Mm. Where it should be. Mm -hmm. um, fucking deserving. So next week's record club is going to be August's recommendation. August, do you want to give us a little uh, of what it's going to be? Next week, we will be talking about a legendary Plunderphonics album, uh, Dyspepsy by the band Negative Land. So that'll, uh, that'll sure to be loads of fun. My understanding, I don't know this for sure, isn't it like a Plunderphonics like parody album or like satire record? Yeah, it's essentially a satire <laughs> record of American commercialization by way of Pepsi. Wow. Well, I, I, I was gonna make like a really bad pun about like, wow, this is like diss Dr. Pepper. That's like, nah, it's too dumb. But no, um, this is where we are. Um, you always choose the most strange records, and I love it. For Epis. Can't wait. It's going to be dope. Uh, so yeah, stick around for that. Let us know in the comments below what you think of Ghost Team. Um, what is your favourite Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds record? What is your relationship with this record? Uh, please do let us know, and um, stick around for our uh, <laughs> other videos! Yeah! And as always, rock over London, rock on Chicago, the woodsman, true characters built by hand. <laughs>